This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today is Brigitte smith conter who is an associate professor in the geology and geophysics department at UH Manoa. And today's topic is a really fascinating one, Brigitte. We're going to be looking in the outer part of the solar system. We're going to be looking at two worlds where potentially there might be life. So before we get started, you're a geologist, uh, right? Geophysicist, yes. A geophysicist who studies the interior of planetary objects. That's right. right? That's correct. And you're looking in the outer part of the solar system. So to get the audience up to speed with the outer solar system, let's take a look at the first slide. Okay. And we're going to be talking about two small moons, or two relatively right. small moons. Um, here we see them. and we're looking at Europa on mm -hmm. the left, right. which is a moon of Jupiter, That's right. and a little tiny moon called Enceladus of Saturn. And um, we don't really have a scale here, but I guess Europa's about the same size as our own Earth's moon. That's, That's right. right. It's a little bit smaller than Earth's moon, about 3,000 kilometers in diameter. Um, and Enceladus is bit, much smaller in size. Way, way smaller. That's right. Enceladus's diameter from end to end is about 500 kilometers. So we're talking 500 compared to 3,000 kilometers in size for these small moons in general. Okay. And we've had on the show in previous episodes, we've had people talking about our own moon. Mm -hmm. Where in the solar system are we going to be exploring? All right. So how far away from the sun are we? Very far distances. We are several distances of Earth to the sun is about... Um, 15 million kilometers away, and Jupiter and Saturn, where these moons reside, are several times that distance. Um, Europa happens to orbit Jupiter, and Saturn, excuse me, Enceladus happens to um, orbit, uh, Enceladus orbits Saturn, okay. um, and so Enceladus is even further distance than Europa is because Saturn is at a further distance from the sun than Jupiter is. And I noticed that both of those uh, moons that we saw in that previous slide, they're this bright color. Um, are right. they made of rock or, or, or something else? They are made of ice. Um, they are made of ice. They are, and they are very bright because they are very, very reflective. Um, the icy surfaces that both of these moons are, um, are surfaced by um, allow the sun's light or energy from Jupiter or Saturn to um, reflect off of their surface. If it was a dark moon, you wouldn't see a very reflective surface at all. These happen to be very bright, icy, sometimes fresh ice that makes some of the most reflective properties on these moons. And so Europa being an icy world about the same size as our own moon, mm -hmm. Um, could have an interesting history. Are, are they about the same age as our own um, moon? You know, we they, know, we think that actually these moon surfaces are geologically young because they show no evidence for old cratered regions like our moon, who has, our moon has sat around for a few billion years and been hit by asteroids um, that leave a mark and haven't been resurfaced since, whereas Enceladus and Europa seem to have a much smoother, glossier look to them with very few surface craters that indicates that these moons could be very geologically young, if not active today, presently yeah. and forming. And I guess because they've got very young surfaces, that might tell us something about what's going on we inside think. these worlds, which make them really fascinating. That's all we've got. We have observations of the surface and some data about the subsurface. And other, after that, we have to apply some basic physics to identify or at least infer what might be taking and place. And as a inside. geophysicist, you're interested not only in the surface, but what's under, underneath. What's driving the underneath, yeah. yeah. Um, we have to use surface images and surface data taken from spectrometers to um, allow us to figure out what kind of molecules and chemicals are at the surface, but the images tell us what the things look like. And then we compare everything to what we know here on Earth, and that's where it gets fun, I guess you could yeah. say. Well, without more ado, let, let's okay. take a more detailed look in the second slide. I think we're going to see one of these two worlds. Uh, talk us through it. We're, we're seeing what may be the moon on the right-hand side, but a couple of other images down at the bottom is that crescent-shaped thing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing this is a slide of um, the surface of Enceladus on the right. Um, you'll see it's very white and bright. Um, and at the bottom corner of the moon um, 
and kind of this is a, an image taken from the South Pole. Um, you can see four what look like bluish streaks. These are actually um, fractures or uh, analogy to faults here on Earth. Um, and these are icy fractures in the South Pole of Enceladus. And from these fractures that we think act like faults, um, we have noticed through observations taken from um, a very special spacecraft called the Cassini spacecraft, um, there are these icy plumes or geysers that are emanating from the South Pole, almost directly coincident with the actual locations of the fractures themselves. Um, these plumes tend to look like they're from isolated spots, but we actually think from different viewing angles they're like curtains of plumes coming up and emanating from um, the faults. And I would guess that perhaps we're looking, the plumes would be like um, Old Faithful Exactly. Earth, except that That's are right. they the same sort of size? Um, these plumes actually, because there's very little gravity on Enceladus, these plumes can rise to several kilometers high up into the atmosphere of Enceladus, whereas Old Faithful is bound by gravity on Earth, which yep. tugs down the water that is emitted from Old Faithful only after a couple of hundreds of feet, I believe. Um, so these plumes, actually, some parts of the plumes um, are light enough that they escape from Enceladus, and they actually have been identified in one of the rings of Saturn. Oh, really? um, we think that these um, jets are actually forming the molecules and particles that form the E-ring, the outermost diffusive ring of Saturn. Um, the ring is there because of Enceladus's jets. So in if you're looking through a telescope at Saturn here <laughs> on Earth, <laughs> and you see parts of Saturn's rings, you're actually seeing something which something. originated from one of the That's moons. right. But, but let me quiz you. Um, you. You said earlier that um, Enceladus and Europa are very young, mm -hmm. but it, I got the impression that only the southern part of that image that we were looking at um, was devoid of craters. So you're right. Um, there are craters on Enceladus' surface, um, whereas some of that terrain would be considered older. But this younger part in the South Polar region is substantially void of craters. Yeah, let's go back to that same slide and just uh, show, show the viewers again that we're actually looking at a whole mm -hmm. variety, right? So the top with lots of holes or That's craters. Right. That's an older terrain. Um, still has been resurfaced enough that it's not as old as Earth's moon. Um, it's substantially younger, but the region in the South Pole where these four structures of faults are, are they have very little craters, if any, um, and very young surface region, we believe, based on the images. Right. And so the area where we've got this sort of this temperature of the tiger stripes, those blue lines, mm -hmm. that must be very young because there's no craters. That's it's right. It's young because it's that's right, and I should point out that the blue lines are actually um, taken with an infrared camera, so it's not true color, it's sort of a false color, and the blue shows up as blue if the ice crystals are slightly larger and potentially a little bit warmer. And so the other map that we're seeing on this slide is um, a map of heat that was acquired at the South Pole. Um, usually the South Pole of Enceladus is very, well, the entire surface is very cold, something like 200 degrees Celsius, minus 200 degrees Celsius. That's about minus 300 and something degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very, very cold. But those, those particular heat structures associated with the faults are 100 degrees in Celsius cooler, or sorry, warmer. And so we think that that heat that's emanating right at those structures is being, is being absorbed from somewhere deeper beneath uh -huh. the South Polar region. The source of it is still under debate. Um, it could be some sort of water body, that, or it could be um, fault-like structures below that are shearing and grinding away. And how do we know it's water or water ice? And we've never uh, yeah. brought anything back from <laughs> We have so. not, no. Hopefully someday we will. Um, the best we've done so far with the Cassini spacecraft is Dai has we've taken the actual um, spacecraft down for a peak. Um, it swooped in and sampled the jets, and the results that came back were that there was water vapor in the jets, um, there was methane, there was some um, um, carbon dioxide and other types of, um, some organic compounds as well, and some mm -hmm. dust particles that allow us to then phone home back to Earth and, and sort out what all this chemistry is about. So this Cassini spacecraft has actually flown through the plumes? It has. Um, we have a slide a little bit later. Okay. Um, I think that, that, is that the next one? Uh, no, it's probably the, <laughs> okay. the one after the next one. Let, let, let's take a look if we can go okay. two slides ahead. That's how we get the heat, I guess. There, there we, we go. go. Yes. So um, the 
most recent flyby of the plumes, or one of the most recent ones, was a couple of years ago in 2015, where um, the Cassini spacecraft dove down as um, shallowly as it has ever to about 40 kilometers above the surface. Um, and the red arrow we're seeing here is the, the path swooping. of the a swooping yeah. spacecraft, right? That's right. Um, and it was able to collect with different instruments on board the spacecraft um, uh, the material in the plumes, actually flying through the plumes and sampling them and trying to sort out what kind of chemicals are inside those plumes. Fascinating. And so I'm seeing um, at the bottom, presumably that's a cutaway diagram of mm -hmm. the moon itself, a and it's saying icy crust, hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents, vents uh -huh. which presumably are, are hot. That's right. And a liquid. So what's causing this heat? I mean, it's such a small world, one yeah. would have expected it to have cool down over the age of the solar system. That's right. So it's an icy world, but we suspect from a lot of good scientific data that it's also a water world, or at least there is some big pockets of water, if not a global ocean underneath its icy crust. Um, we don't know exactly how thick the icy crust is on Enceladus, but we think that it's about maybe 20 kilometers, and below that is liquid water, an ocean, just like Earth's ocean. And um, where it came from, we believe, is from heating from inside the moon because the moon gets tugged and pulled as it goes around Saturn. And it, it orbits Saturn once every day and a half or and so. And if we back up to the, the previous slide, mm -hmm. I think you've got a little cartoon. Here we go. Yeah. Um, so there's a graphic that shows um, Saturn and then this wobbly body orbiting Saturn. Um, and over its course of its orbit around Saturn, Enceladus encounters a closer position to Saturn and then moves along on its orbit and is further away from Saturn. And when it's the closest to Saturn, it, it, it um, experiences some very high gravitational forces. Saturn is just pulling and tugging on it. And then when it moves away from Saturn, the gravity is lessened. And so because of the difference in gravity and pulling and tugging, Enceladus gets pulled and tugged inside. And that that tidal heating causes heat inside to actually melt the ice that would be ice into an ocean body. Um, this happens on several different moons of Jupiter and Saturn and potentially uh, Neptune and Uranus. Um, but for, particularly for these bodies, we think that the ocean layer may be quite considerable um, that may allow for these surface geologic activities and, to be seen. Uh, I, I think in a previous show, we actually had a discussion of the active volcanoes on the moon of Jupiter called Io. Mm -hmm. Is this exactly the same sort of thing? Because yeah. there aren't that big uh, moons further out. That's right. Saturn, so. um, this is the same tidal f flexing and forcing idea, except that Io is so close to Jupiter that it experiences extreme heating. And Io is a rocky body and probably got so warm that it couldn't hang on to its water. But in Europa is much further out from Jupiter, sorry, from, uh, from Jupiter, and so, or Enceladus is from Jupiter, uh, Saturn, sorry about that. And so the further out you are from your parent planet that you're orbiting, the less of a, a gravitational tug you're feeling. Um, and so Enceladus may have had ice and water um, because it is at a nice location where it can actually maintain those conditions. It may have not always been that way in the past and perhaps it may not have a stable orbit now. So this is one example. Um, we're coming up to the break in the show right now, Brigitte, but I know you've got another one. And right. we'll, we'll take a, a, a look at a second moon um, in the solar system, which has almost the same set of circumstances. That's right. Is that That's right. I stumbled through those words, but I'm well, I'll well, right, we'll right, right. looking at Europa, <laughs> which has suddenly appeared right. on the screen. Um, but we're about due to take a break, so let me just remind our viewers you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, and our guest today is Brigitte Smith Conter, who is an associate professor in the Geology and Geophysics Department at UH Manoa. And we'll be back right soon. Bye. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. Put on the list, it's who's gonna drive. It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DT. Captain of our team. It's a DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver.
and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today is Bridget Smith-Conter, who's an associate professor in the Geology and Geophysics Department at UH Manoa. And before we leave <laughs> the Saturn system, yes. which we, we really have got to talk about the Cassini spacecraft, which provided all of those wonderful data, right? That's right. So, so what do we need to tell the audience? Uh, an important event is coming up in the life time, a lifespan of the Cassini spacecraft. Um, this was originally arrived at the, uh, sorry, the Saturn system in 2004, um, and we are experiencing the last few weeks of its lifetime. It's running out of fuel. Um, the spacecraft has surpassed even the milestones we thought it would um, in the last 11, 12 years of, of observation. Um, and on September 15th, um, 2017, the um, NASA and those that help orient the satellite will um, purposefully dive it into Saturn's atmosphere in order to prevent any type of contamination or crash landing into um, a moon. So or in about two to three weeks, right. our viewers may actually start hearing they might, yeah. press releases yeah. from NASA or the European Space Agency yeah. about saying goodbye to the It's a bittersweet car. time, yes. It's <laughs> bittersweet, and we also have had a previous show on the methane lakes of Titan. Oh, and yes. it's the same spacecraft. The same spacecraft. It did a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, a lot Very of good. amazing okay, discoveries. Well, we'll, we'll keep our okay. ears tuned to that. But <laughs> let's good. move on to the, the, the other world, okay. which you're going to tell us about. This is Europa. We saw it briefly before the break, so if we can bring back. This looks quite different, I mean, apart from the fact that the lines on it are orange as opposed to blue. Yeah. Yes. Tell us a bit about Europa. So Europa is our other water world that um, has, has excited scientists for a couple of decades now. Um, this is a not pure ice surface. Um, it's mixed with a lot of these red streaks, as you mentioned, Pete. Um, and the red streaks, um, or linea they're called, are perhaps evidence of faults and plate-like motion of shifting of ice at the icy surface of Europa and perhaps an expression of what could be happening down below in terms of moving water around that, that translates to icebergs shifting around the surface. The red, though, we believe, could be um, evidence for the, some sort of deposit of salt. Um, I think we have a close-up of a few of these red lines. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Ah, here we there go. go. Yes. So, so this is not true color though. We're seeing um, this is yeah, false, false color. False color. That's right. Um, I don't know what band of um, uh, imagery yeah. this is. But One wouldn't see it with one's eye. Yeah, it's it. Okay. The reddish brings out um, what we think is perhaps magnesium sulfate um, in the in the icy crust, um, and it, it's a mixture of different chemicals, but. Um, we believe it could be uh, the, the icy surface is tapping into um, chemical compounds in the, in the ocean below that are being brought up um, to the surface at these fault-like structures um, and perhaps recirculated throughout, sort of like plate tectonics on Earth. Um, we see those banded fractures that are labeled there are analogous to what could be spreading centers at Earth's um, ridge system um, in the bottom of the oceans. Um, and these bands can be 20 kilometers wide, so a significant uh, portion of Honolulu yeah. could sit in okay. one of these bands. Now, you've mentioned water a number of times. Yes. Is that important, knowing that there's liquid water somewhere? It is absolutely relevant, um, especially when we're studying these bodies, because um, we don't, water is a source of life here on Earth, and um, Wherever there's life, there's water, or wherever there's water, there's life, I should say, on Earth. And so that tends, takes us to the idea of, well, if there's water on these other bodies in the far distant cold regions of the solar system, could life, primitive life, microorganism type of life, actually have once grown there or be trying to develop now? Um, and so we need to know a lot more about these two moons in order to, to gain a sense of if the conditions for life are ripe. But um, there are some four functional things you need for life to exist on a moon and on Earth. Um, one is you need water. And check both of these moons okay. we believe have water bodies. Um, a second thing is you need an energy source. Um, we can talk about that in a minute if we'd like. A third is that um, we need some sort of organic um, chemistry to take place, something with carbon. Um, and then the fourth is a stable environment. And we believe Europa and possibly Enceladus have 
three out of those four, the only question is, is whether or not these two moons have a stable environment. If they have been stably orbiting their, their parent planet long enough to host life and keep it there and maintain it. Um, and that's a question to still sort out. But um, we, we know there's water beneath both of these bodies. We just need to understand how thick it is and what the... And the energy source we already saw with Enceladus is this gravitational energy. That's so right. Um, we believe that there is an energy source that allows for the heating, but we also think that there could be this hydrothermal process um, that mixes the water bodies with the rocks at the bottom of the seafloor mm -hmm. that stirs up this mineral-rich water that may be... Um, an environment that very primitive and exotic ex organisms can actually um, thrive and develop. And that's where we find some of the most exotic um, organisms in Earth's oceans is the bottom of the seafloor from these heated vents coming up from Earth's mantle or Earth's um, upper crust. And so the conditions for that type of process taking place in Europa and Enceladus um, are pretty good as well. We're seeing evidence right. at the surface So a uh, $64,000 question. Yeah. Why, why would we care? Uh, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, if there was life beyond the Earth, uh, do you um, want to go there at sure, all? Sure, sure. Um, some of it is just, um, you know, inquisition. And we, we want to know about where actually, um, how Earth developed and how life developed on Earth. But don't we want to know beyond Earth and what the conditions are beyond our own home planet and if life could persist not just here and how special are we? Is Earth mm -hmm. the one and only in the universe? Is there life on other bodies? And if there is, that's an indication that there could be life on other planets and other stars, and you can go on from there. Sure. Um, sure. But uh, there's just so much curiosity out there that makes us want to think and believe that there could be all the conditions right for life. We just have to go and find it. So if it is important to discover life beyond Earth, mm -hmm. what's NASA doing about it? I believe you, you're part of a team or uh, Getting there, yes. You're getting there? Getting there. I'm, I'm on a, a pseudo future. team, that's right. Um, so there is a, um, a mission being planned by NASA um, called the Europa Clipper. Okay. Um, and this has been a, a mission being planned for a long time, but the funds from um, Congress have now been allocated and they're working on the planning part of this mission. But it's to send a Europa spacecraft, um, or a spacecraft to Europa, uh, hopefully launched in the early 2020s. The spacecraft will have about nine instruments on top of it, or inside of it, that will be able to observe the different parts of Europa. This will go into orbit around Europa, or sorry, in orbit around Jupiter, um, and with flybys past Europa. Jupiter itself has such a um, harsh and um, uh, radiation environment that if you were to send a mission directly to Europa, um, the instrument would not be living very long. So um, there will be flybys of Europa in order to get out of that harsh environment as quickly as possible. And then there is the plan to send a lander to the surface of wow. Europa and hopefully do some nice geophysical um, okay, so, tests. So I'm yeah. a sci-fi fan, and yes. I watch the science fiction movie <laughs> Europa Report. Okay. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking of, or is it more Arthur C. Clarke 2010 kind of thing? <laughs> so, they're hoping to <laughs> land safely um, and protect it and as, as with much um, technology as we can, um, a lander that would do some basic geophysical observations. And, um, and the geophysics would be what? Uh, you know, you can, um, if you had a seismometer on top of the lander, you would be able to test um, uh, what types of seismic waves would be propagating through the icy crust, um, perhaps from faults moving, um, to see how thick the ice crust is as well. Um, they can do surface measurements where they can actually dig up material and onboard analyze it to see what the ice is made out of. Um, these are all high risk um, endeavors though yeah. because a lander is not safe on the surface of Europa because of the harsh radiation so environment. So you say by the mid 2020s the spacecraft might fly, so are they Couple starting years. to build it now? Um, they're in the works for planning it and, and I would assume that the construction it will be underway soon. Um, some of these um, proposal teams of getting these instruments put together are still being built and NASA is delegating responsibility as we I speak. know one of the former graduate students from UH is actually building one of the spectrometers. Very good. For this mission. So Very think. good. Which, which leads me into, and this is a esoteric kind of topic to be working in. So yeah. <laughs> how did you get here, I mean not to the studio, yeah. but how did you get to the point in your academic career that you're studying these worlds in the far solar system. Hmm. And how, how might some junior undergraduate, if she wanted to follow your footpaths, you know, how did you get 
please. I hopscotched around, quite right. honestly. Um, I started out as a um, uh, astronomy and physics major and received my undergraduate degree in that field. And then I jumped ship and went over to study geophysics on Earth, studying terrestrial bodies. Um, because I was interested in how faults work, and I didn't get enough of that in the astronomy field, and so um, I was lucky enough to move along through my graduate career studying um, the San Andreas Fault and figuring out how fault systems move and deform and, and how we can um, observe that. And then I was um, just ran into an opportunity to apply these physical methods on Earth to study the icy environment of Enceladus as a postdoctoral scientist. And it all just worked out together. I used the physics on Earth to study the physics on Enceladus. Okay. So as we've heard in many other shows, it's having a, a, a science or a STEM background, whether it's Absolutely. science or technology, yeah. engineering, or math. That's right. And um, you know, taking the necessary classes to support that, but also taking some of the computer um, coding courses nowadays and keeping up, because all of this is done on computers and all of this is done with models and being able to, understand, under, how, able to understand how computers can help us understand the math and the physics is a big tool. And I know that you teach a 100 level undergraduate right. course at UH this semester. That's right. Is there a lot of enthusiasm for this sort of thing? I think so. Um, no one's fallen asleep in class yet. That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, no, I always get students that come by after class and ask me a question about you know whatever material we've been talking about. But they're particularly interested in these really up-to-date missions, like the Cassini mission, um, perhaps like the Europa lander that yeah. will be arriving soon. It's happening now. This isn't 20 years ago in your textbook that you're reading. Wonderful so. career path for this Exciting. Sort of student. Exciting. Yes. Yeah. And Maybe by the time they're doing their postdoctoral degrees, there'll be all these data back from the Europe. That's right. That's right. That's right. Terrific. Well, I'm afraid we've got to the end of the show. Okay. Um, but hopefully, you can come back and tell us more <laughs> about earthquakes and <laughs> my uh, other hat, and, yes. and the Cassini <laughs> mission. Well. Let me just remind the viewers: you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, and our guest today has been Brigitte Smith Conter, who is an associate professor in the Geology and Geophysics Department at UH Manoa. So hopefully you'll be able to join us again uh, in two weeks' time after Labor Day uh, when we'll have another interesting guest. So thanks for watching and see you again soon. Bye.